Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming. My name is Isabel Gavaldon, I'm the curator at Gasworks. And first of all, I would really like to thank Heidi Kopp Jung, who has come all the way from Germany to be with us here tonight, which is really, really amazing. And before introducing Heidi properly, I would just say a few words about the background of this event and actually Heidi's collaboration and her involvement in Galapagos Films Exhibition. As many of you may know already, Gala is an artist that has been working for a long time really around archaeological collections. And this exhibition at Gasworks basically provided this unique opportunity for Gala to respond to the British Museum, which is, of course, the blueprint of every encyclopedic collection. It also hosts thousands of contested objects acquired very often under colonial rule from all over the world. And a question that Gala had in her mind since the beginning about the show, and she really wanted to tackle, was how do museums deal with everything that is alive in their collections? And when Gala means living entities or things that are alive, she really means a bunch of different things. She means the souls and spirits of entities, people that are inhabiting certain objects or human remains. She also means literal organic life, like fungi or microorganisms that museum staff tries to control. And during her research, Gala got fascinated by this stone, this funerary stella, which is currently on display at the British Museum, and you can see a depiction of it in the second gallery. And basically, that stone contains the lyrics of a song, of a very ancient song, uh, celebrating the achievements and the bond between two men, Or and Suti. The Stella, apparently, obviously, I can read uh, Egyptian, uh, high you can. Apparently, the Stella describes them as brothers. Some Egyptologists have assumed that they might be a same-sex couple. There's no way we can know. Anyhow, Gala got interested about the idea of whether we could revive somehow this song for the exhibition. And there's where actually Heidi comes into the picture. We were looking for someone that would be able to recite these lyrics. And we opened a conversation with Heidi. She not only was happy to recite the text, she also showed us an amazing range of historical replicas of ancient instruments, pharaonic instruments. She also said that she would be able to respond to those lyrics and revive, recreate something that is kind of far lost for us. And an incredible conversation between Gala and Heidi started. A conversation about the limits of historical knowledge, also about the role of creativity and invention and speculation within historical studies and your own work. And before, like, rather than kind of talking anymore, I will just introduce Heidi. Um, Dr. Heidi Kopp-Jung is a German Egyptologist and archaeologist as a, and a classically trained musician. She has excavated in Germany and Egypt she has published three books and over a hundred articles about music in ancient Egypt and other topics. She is a professor, an assistant professor in Egyptian archaeology at the Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw. In addition, she also has a musical career playing replicas of ancient Egyptian instruments and other instruments such as sistrums and lyres and lutes. And today she'll be presenting part of her research and also giving a sort of lecture performance around yeah. her work. And I hope you'll enjoy the presentation. Thanks so much, Heidi, for being here today. Thank you. Yeah, we will have, so to say, a, a three topic thing. Uh, research, music, and music archaeology, and our Suti and Tor. Um, I wrote down my text because when I'm a little bit excited, uh, the words don't come to my mind. So it's, it's a foreign language for me, so please. Forgive me. <laughs> okay, at first, of course, I would like to thank uh, Gala Poras Kim for inviting me to recompose this stele of uh, Zuti and Hor and take part in her exhibition. I never was part in an, uh, of an exhibition. It's, of course, wonderful and it's a great honor for me. And I'm incredibly uh, proud to be part of a project and to be part of art. <laughs> wonderful. And, of course, I would like to thank Gasworks. Isabel Gavaldon, yes, <laughs> Joel Furness and Eleni Zakariu for the invitation and they made it possible that I can be here for you live. The other way would have been uh, via Zoom and of course this is much more exciting, I hope at least. Not that you fall asleep after half an hour. Okay, so um, I try not to, uh, to be too uh, scientific but Okay, I have to be a little bit. 
In the Old Kingdom, in the time of the pyramids, a great number of textual and iconographic documents refer to music and musicians. Music was not only entertainment, but played a major role in ritual text as well, be it in temples or in tombs. In the time of Tutankhamen, the walls and temples show wonderful banquets with musicians. We will see some of them. Um, but what did the music sound like in ancient music? How can we reconstruct it? In the following, we will discuss the music of ancient Egypt as well as the oldest instrument in the world at all and the oldest instruments in Egypt. After that, we will look at the experimental music archaeology. What is it? What do, am I doing in my research? And how can we bring ancient Egyptian music back to life? Uh, for that, I have a lot of uh, historical, historically accurate replicas. This is only the half of what I have because the luggage was not big enough and uh, I have to be, uh, I was a little bit afraid that they take it away from me in, at the airplane. <laughs> Okay, so let's start. This is what we will talk about, an overview about Egyptian musicians, about Egyptian instruments, the earliest music in Egypt and the earliest music in the world. And then we will take a look at ancient Egyptian music life. What is experimental music archaeology at all? And I will perform for you and I hope you will join. <laughs> so at the end of the day, you will be able to sing ancient Egyptian. So at first a look at the musicians, male and female musicians are related to the court or a temple and some female singers have the title Chantress of a God, Chantress of Amun, Chantress of Ra. Likewise, vocalists could be booked by private individuals like today. Musicians are evidenced in different ways. One approach is based on monuments which the musicians had erected or dedicated on their own, like the tomb of the flutist Ipi in Dashur, 2600 BC. So this is his tomb, the so-called Mastaba, and this is a photo that was taken in 1950 when it was found. Maybe you can see it. we have two statues. If we have a closer look, we see that it's not only a statue, but the flutist has his flute on his statue. And that this is the only time that something like that happens. Of course, it's broken. I mean, it's uh, two days older. <laughs> but nevertheless, we can see it. But other musicians uh, do not have tombs on their own, but they are mentioned and depicted on objects of others, like the harpist. Hekenu and the singer Ichi. They are on the false door of Nikaura and Ihad from uh, Zakara about 2500 BC, but it's only here, tiny, 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 but nevertheless they are in this tomb. And we can read their names very easy so that you learn some hieroglyphs. I, T, I, okay, so her name is Iti, and this is Ha, Ka and Nu. So we read it, Hekenu. Okay, please keep that in mind. I will ask you at the end of the lecture. <laughs> but uh, we have, um, of course, we have to uh, keep in mind uh, the most of you, the musicians are not known by name and are not known at all. They are often depicted, but without names. So this, this is really an exception. How do musicians uh, look like? <laughs> Sometimes like this, splendidly dressed like these female musicians and sometimes only scantily dressed, especially the dancers and uh, the lute players. But don't be afraid, I will not play like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> so this lady is not naked. It looks like that, but this is very thinly woven translucent linen. Okay, and here we see tattoos. So this is no invention of the uh, new era, but it was uh, known already in ancient Egypt. You see here the god Bees on her leg. And again, it's a nearly naked uh, lute player and we will not think what this little ape is trying to do. 
Sometimes we have a special uh, hairstyle, but it's only in Dynasty 6, 2300 BC. And then the girls have those braids and a disc at the end. And we know that it's a disc and not a ball because we have a little statue. And in this statue you can see, okay, it's a disc and not a ball. So, if we look at the performer, the composer, the songwriter and the lyricist, the performing musicians are not necessarily identical with the original composer, songwriter or lyricist like today. Although it cannot be excluded in individual cases, since three different stages of artistic creation are noticeable. The first one is to put words into poetry. The second one consists in the musical accompaniment of the words. And the third one covers the musical performance by singing. These different features are not to be mixed up. Somebody who has poetical skills is not necessarily a gifted composer or a singer with vocal capabilities. A singer with a very excellent voice might not have the ability to write poetry or to create tunes for them. Moreover, an instrumentalist may be able to compose melodies for existing poetry, but might be unable to write them on his own or to sing them. Another fact that we know about musicians, they are very, very mobile, so like today, like Bon Jovi. <laughs> and in this case, that are even ladies. We have chantresses of the god Amun. One was in Thebes at home and she traveled to Heliopolis. These are only 660 kilometers, but of course she had to go back as well. So that we have more than 1000 kilometers for, just for, a, uh, for singing in a temple. So it was done, although she just stayed there for some days and traveled back. And then we have a singer here in Megiddo and even in Byblos. So if we think that the one in Byblos started in Thebes, she had to travel 1200 kilometers one way. So they are really, really mobile and traveled a lot. Okay, now we look at the instruments. We have uh, four um, four groups, four, <laughs> so these are um, uh, aerophones, membranophones, idiophones and chordophones, so that you learn something, you can take something home with you. Um, before you get a heart attack, I will tell you all the instruments in detail. <laughs> so at first we have the aerophones, these are flute, trumpet and forerunners of the modern clarinet and oboe. The flutes are known since the 1st millennium BC and the trumpets appear about 1350 BC and were mainly used in military context. Membranophones, barrel drum, round and rectangular frame drums, Round drums are attested since 2600 BC. Rectangular frame drums since Dynasty 18, which is about 1550 BC. Then we have idiophones, clapper, sistrum, menite, rattle, bell and cymbal. Rattle and clappers were used since earliest times. The sistrum, known since 2400 BC, like the menite, is closely connected to the goddess Hathor. Bells and cymbals are particularly known from Greco-Roman times. So this is so to say yesterday, yeah, Greco-Roman period, the time of uh, Caesar and Cleopatra. And then we have the chordophones, <clears throat> harp, lute and lyre. Harps are attested since 2600 BC, lyres since 2900 BC and lutes since 1650. While the use of plectra can be observed with the lute as well as with the lyre, this is not the case with the harps. At first we look at the aerophones, flute, trumpet, forerunners of the modern clarinet. They appear, for example, in these scenes known from the time of the pyramids. So we have here several girls dancing, some of them are hand clapping, and then we have here the flute, flute player and two harpists and a singer. So a band in the time of a pyramid would consist of a flute player and of harp players and a singer. Very famous is this scene from the time of Neb Amun, more or less Tutankhamen. And we see here a lady with a double oboe, at least. No mouthpieces, 
from ancient Egypt survived, but some wind instruments of pharaonic times resemble modern folk clarinets with one lamella and therefore are called clarinets. The same applies to the double lamellae instrument resembling the Greek aulos. Okay, so we have a lot from ancient Egypt, but not everything. But again, please have a look at this wonderful uh, clothing of the lady. This is, a, how is it called? Plissé, plest, <coughs> dressing. The trumpet. Tudenke man had two trumpets in his tomb. One was of uh, silver and one of, of, was of bronze. And they were both on such a stand. This is the wooden stand where they were found. And the BBC took, um, th they made uh, recordings. Exactly, uh -huh. the first are falling asleep. <laughs> I'm sorry. I will start singing quite soon. <laughs> the BBC recorded it in front of the uh, golden shrines of Tudenkemen in the museum in Cairo. So for those who have been there, maybe you recognize it. Okay, and this is the trumpet and now I realize what I forgot. Uh, I have it with me, but nevertheless, I mean the sound, not the trumpet. But we ca you can listen to it at YouTube, you will find it there. And uh, the Greek philosopher Plutarch compares their sound in the first century AD to the braying of an ass. So if you are interested, you can make your own decision about that. Look at it at YouTube. Okay, now we turn to the membranophones, round frame drum, rectangular frame drum, and barrel drum. Several of them are now in museums, as far as I remember, even here in the British Museum. These are examples from the Cairo Museum. And this is a soldier that had his uh, barrel drum on his back like uh, a backpack. You see, here are two strings, and he's wearing it like a, like a rucksack. And here you see how big they are. This is a relief from a temple and you see they are really, really huge. This is a round frame drum from the Greco-Roman temple in Atribis, Atribis near Dohag. This is my latest um, excavation. Um, they asked me to come to look for water, for canal, for channels and so on. And uh, suddenly I realized, <gasps> Somebody's playing a round frame drum, yeah! <laughs> and of course, all the other excavators, they just wanted to read the texts. They were not interested in the instrument, and now yeah, I nearly got a heart attack. Nevertheless, <laughs> um, this is uh, quite frequently used for religious music. Okay, so I will show you how they are. It is only a, a frame of wood and some leather on it. And of course, you don't have to think that it is a simple instrument. You can play it, of course, in several ways. And uh, here we have the example that it's that they she holds it like this. You see it? Okay, I can. Oh God, I'm old. <laughs> okay, so if we have a look at this, you can play it like this. Then it looks diff uh, sounds different as if you take it. You hear the difference? Okay, so here we have it like this and then she's playing. Do you see it? So I would say, okay, this is not a very comfortable way to play it. And now we have to keep in mind, this is a relief. This is not a photo. I mean, of course, a photo of the relief, but nevertheless, we have to keep in mind that the artist who made this has maybe never seen a lady playing the round frame drum. Yeah, so this is why sometimes these things appear. Or when you see horses and chariots, that they are um, too near together, so that you n n see, okay, that cannot work. No? So there are different reasons why, these, why we have to be careful when we look at these reliefs and at the paintings. We have a rectangular frame drum like this one. This is, appears only in Dynasty 18 and it was found directly in front of a tomb. So we can assume that it was used during the funeral and then it was left there. Okay. And another scene from uh, Jebel el Silsile, a lady playing the, uh, 
rectangular frame drum and you see she is nearly naked except for her, how do you call it, uh, not collar? Like a belt. Yeah, belt, danke, genau. <laughs> like a belt and uh, we have the same for the dancer, what we had some slides before for the lute player. Yeah, so again nearly naked. We turn to the idiophones, clappers, sistra, menit, rattles, bells and cymbals. The clappers are attested since the 4th millennium BC. You see them here, Min holding clappers in hands and they are playing to a kind of goddess. And later we have instruments like this, they look like hands and very often there is the face of the goddess Hathor on it. Okay. Again, if we use it, you know these things from your school. And this is what you have to keep in mind. It was not even invented by the Egyptians. It's much, much older and we still use the same instruments. Yeah? And again, keep in mind that it's not an easy, uh, uh, how do you call it, profane, simple instrument. But you can do so much with it. For now, you play it like this or like this. It's again another sound and you can even make something like this. So you can be very creative with it and not just like... So, and then we have this so-called Sistrum. This is... Uh, there are two kinds. The, uh, one looks like this one, the so-called Naos Sistrum, and the other one had this loop. Okay. Again, several kinds of playing, like this, like you know it from the Stele, and... And you can, of course, even use it around your figure. And again, it's something different, as if you just make it like this. And again, you would say, yes, yes, I know a system. Of course you know. You learn it at school as well. So this thing was invented 2400 BC by the Egyptians, and it's still in use. Nowadays, we do not use it to appeal the gods but just to have fun with it. But in the beginning, in the very beginning, it was used to appeal the gods. To, before you make a worship, you make like this to make sure God is listening. At least you hope it. And again, that it's not a, a simple instrument. We see it from this. You see here the teacher and priest of Hathor, Chesuwer. Chesuwer is teaching several ladies to play the zistrum. And here we see that he teaches them how um, to clap their hands. Again, you can do it like this. I hope you will do it at the end of the show. Or you can do it like this. You can change it, whatever. You can even make it like this. And it's always a different sound. And maybe you know this folks, folk dance in Germany when they make it on their feet. I will not show that. <laughs> not in high heels. So, and then we have a special instrument. This is really only attested in ancient Egypt. This is a so-called menit or menat. It's something like a string metal, but it's more elegant because you have here a handle. So if you take it here and you rattle, you again have a sound. And it's very often used together with the sistrum. But it's not only a musical instrument, but you wear it around your neck. Yeah? And the ladies know it if the, if it, uh, if the um, how do you call it, kette? If it's too heavy, it falls like this. So this is why they have the counterpart, so that everything is sitting perfectly. And they invented it 2400 BC. Okay, and it's all, uh, very often played together. We see here the goddess Isis in the uh, temple of Abydos. She has a menid in her hand and a sistrum. Yeah, playing it both together. My favorite instrument is absolutely this one. Rattles. Rattles are attested since the 5th millennium BC. They are made of wood, bust, faience or clay and they are filled with small uh, seeds or clay balls and maybe you realize that this is a hedgehog. Isn't that amazing? Look here, he has his hands 
and his feet wonderful i love it <laughs> okay so uh, of course they uh, the um, the sound depends on the material so this is of course not as loud as this one that you know from every show yeah and you uh, probably they were invented no um, the first rattles were dried fruits where only the seeds are in it yeah and so to say from yesterday <laughs> are uh, bells and cymbals the cymbals appear about uh, yeah in uh, after christ so we have it in the roman period and the bells again very late but there are some forerunners nevertheless we start in the first millennium bc you remember the last thing we had in the fifth millennium so this is a really really a huge uh, chronological um, period okay symbols although they are so small they are quite loud isn't it okay now we turn to the chorophones harp lyre and lute the harps uh, are sometimes uh, wonderful decorated. Ah, here, this is from the British Museum. So tomorrow you have to go to the museum and check that. And there are different uh, kinds of harps. Sometimes they are smaller, sometimes they are bigger. And this is the, the so-called topos of a blind harper. Sometimes they have their eyes closed and some researchers thought, okay, they were, um, they were made blind to play better. But just look at YouTube, every second musician is playing. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure that they are really blind. <laughs> Maybe just concentrating. Okay, and then we have the lyre. This is the very first depiction of a lyre in ancient Egypt. Uh, I suppose you see nothing. So this is why I show you the drawing. So we have a caravan of Asiatics and they bring the lyre to ancient Egypt. They come from the desert and bring the instrument to Egypt. There are very uh, different types of it. So this is a absolutely different one. Here is the sound box and the strings were like this. Yeah, but they are gone. And we have here a horse, a duck. Uh, you have to keep in mind, we don't have 440 hertz. No concert pitch, no international standard pitch. And that means that the Egyptian music could sound key off to our ears. Especially, just have in mind, we have seven harpists with more than 50 strings. So I think somebody with an absolute ear, yeah, maybe that would have been uh, problematic. But nevertheless, I, br I brought you a lyre. So we have uh, the lute that I will show you afterwards. That we know the tuning, but we don't know the tuning of the lyres in ancient Egypt. But nevertheless, this is an, another part of uh, working as an uh, um, experimental music archaeologist look around the corner, and then we find out that uh, the Mesopotamian tuning is known from the th uh, second millennium BC. Okay, so you can now listen to the tuning, which is called Gublitu. I'm sorry I have to read it here because I cannot, I can only read hier uh, hieroglyphics and not Mesopotamian music. So just to give you an uh, impression, And of course, you cannot tune it as perfect as you can do it today. You have only a piece of wood and more or less, hopefully, a good feeling for tunes. So, okay, so... And probably you realize the acoustic is absolutely different from what we know today. So if I would bring you my guitar, that would sound a little bit louder. <laughs> So let us now turn to the lute. Lutes are played while sitting or walking. 
And if you have a look at it, how the instrument is held, they don't hold it like a guitar, so to say, like this. They hold it like a baby. A little bit, isn't it? In the, yeah. So why do they do it? Again, you realize it when you have such an instrument in your hand. This is because uh, there are six sound holes. And if you use it like, an, uh, like a guitar, like this, then you close the sound holes. Okay, so this is why they uh, use it like this. And if you play it now, the thumb is in a special place here on the neck. And this is the place where we have the biggest uh, um, distance. So in German, we would say uh, schnarren. It's the best place to, to uh, use, uh, to, to play the instrument. Not here and not here, so here it's perfect. So obviously they, they knew what they were doing with this instrument. So usually the back is of a um, turtle back or of wood. We see here a smaller one and a bigger one together in one, um, in one band, so to say. So here we have the bigger one, one, one meter and 20 centimeters. So it's twice as tall as this one. And these uh, things, this is not decoration, but this is for tuning. Okay, and now we look at the dancer's lute. This is the lute that was, uh, so to say, the mama of my replica. Um, this was found in Dynasty 18, around the time of Tutankhamen, 1400 BC. And from this instrument, we know exactly how it was tuned. So this is why uh, I bought it. Uh, I did not uh, um, build it on my own, but if, um, if you can, cannot do something, ask somebody who can. This is what I did. And the lady was Susanna Schulz from Berlin. She's a musicologist, a plug instrument maker and a luthier. And she built it according to the specifications of Professor Eichmann. He's, so to say, the lord of music archaeology, and he uh, uh, wrote several books on... I, I'm sure he would like that. <laughs> he, would, uh, he wrote several books on the Egyptian lute. Okay, so if we... I knew it. Sorry, I have to tune it. And here you learn again something. These, the guts are, of course, natural guts. That means you have to uh, tune it every minute. At least it feels like this. Okay, and now, okay, now you can see how it is uh, tuned. You have to move these things very carefully. So it sounds a little bit more Chinese in my ears uh, and not really uh, Arabian. So we have no Arabian scale. And you hear when I'm not at the microphone, it's really, really tiny, tiny, tiny. Okay, good. So just some, some things I will play it. Uh, to you later with some songs, with real songs. Um, we have many possibilities with music archaeologies and we have many borders. So I will show you something. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so obviously we, uh, uh, we can assume that the ancient Egyptians did not invent smoke on the water. <laughs> okay, so we have to keep in mind we can do nearly everything with a lute and with all the instruments. But of course, we don't know if they did it as well. So it's only a reconstruction, a recomposing. If somebody tries to sell you a CD with original Egyptian music, beat him <laughs> and save your money. <laughs> OK, so this, uh, this is what they had in their best times. But how was the earliest music? How did it start? Music was not invented, invented by the ancient Egyptian. That's a point that I do not love. <laughs> but the uh, music was invented in Europe. So we have this bone 
of a cave beer. Isn't that amazing? And it's uh, 43,000 years old. It was found in Divje Babe in Slovenia. So this is the oldest instrument. Pardon? Sorry, um, I just said for a second, I thought you meant the bear had made the flute. <laughs> <laughs> that is very, very Yeah, Th this is scientific research, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we have the flutes from the Swabian Alp, which is, which is so to say around the corner from where I live now. Uh, at first they found one. They excavated it in the 90s and well, you, when you have an excavation you have boxes, hundreds, hundreds of boxes. Okay, and you have one box with stones, one box with bones and one lady had uh, the task, uh, look at the bones. Okay, she looked at the bones and some realized, Ugh! There are holes. Okay, and now it's the point that you, have the, that you must have as a researcher the good idea, this might be a flute. So she searched and searched and they found more pieces and up to now they have 10 flutes. Wow. Well, amazing, isn't it? And it's now a World Heritage sign. So I brought you one. This is from the bone of a griffin vulture. Just in case somebody ever heard the word griffin vulture. <laughs> Okay, I will try, but I'm quite sure I will not get a tone out of it. No, it's not working. But nevertheless, this is the bone. It's an original bone. It's not made of plastic. Uh, please feel free after the concert to come here to look and to, to no? and if you get a tone out of it, I, you I get a CD as a gift. <laughs> Okay, and then we have this thing, a mammoth shoulder, a shoulder blade, and the other thing was, how is it called, a, a, this part of a mammoth. Okay, so I had, get, I had a good idea, I built this. Of course, in our grocery they had no mammoth, so I had to take oxen, uh, but, but I was afraid to bring it because I, uh, I'm, I was sure when I had those bones in my luggage. <laughs> <laughs> they will call me out. So nevertheless, um, I received it and they were really, really large. So if you uh, put them together, there's energy in it that they uh, part from each other. So if you are the shaman, is that the right word? The shaman, okay, and you want to bring your, your folks into a trance, you have to play the whole night. Yeah, if, to if you have to do it like this, you will be tired after half an hour. But if you take the bones that are, have so much energy in it, you can do it all the night. So this is why they chose them, again. And of course you cannot realize it if you see it in the museum. You have to check it. Okay, now the Egyptian ancient music, the earliest music. We have a rattle from the 5th millennium BC. It's about eight centimeters made of clay and it was not found in a tomb but it was found in a settlement. So this is quite interesting and they do not have only this uh, form but others are like fruits and sometimes even in sets. So you don't have only one rattle but a whole, uh, a whole set and what I really love are these in the shape of flower bud of a water lily. Isn't that amazing? And again in the fourth millennium BC. So this is the very earliest instrument in ancient Egypt. And then we have to wait for several hundred years and the next instrument appears. Our clappers. We saw them already. But at first they appeared as depictions. And it took another nearly 500 years until we have the earliest instruments. And you see they have the form of uh, different animals. So and again some hundred years later the first flute. This is a so-called uh, palette the size really really big and there are uh, very strange things on it. You see that with uh, wings, a griffon with wings 
and we have this maybe priest or whatever in the shape of an uh, Esel. Was heißt Esel? Donkey. Danke. <laughs> Danke. Okay, uh, in the shape of a donkey, and the donkey is playing the flute, 3100 BC. But this is not the only f flute of this time. A little bit later, we have a combination, a uh, um, flute and a rattle, both in one. And if you, if you, put, uh, if you breathe inside, if you, there comes the tone E. You can check it in the Petri Museum, it's around the corner. <laughs> Just ask them, may I use your uh, rattle flute? <laughs> I'm sure they will be happy. <laughs> Tell them, Heidi said we are allowed. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay, then we have to uh, wait another some hundred years before we have the first hand clapping. So this is a um, mace head, a real big one. It's now in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, and there are a depiction on it. And we see depictions of three girls hand clapping, and they are even dancing. Okay, and probably you know the film The Scorpion King. There are two Scorpion Kings in ancient Egypt in the fourth millennium BC, so they just look a little bit different. <laughs> okay, then now at the same time, we have singing for the first time. And we know that from this stele. It's a little bit a stele like the one around the corner that we will talk about later, but uh, 1,500 years earlier. So this is the stele. And here we see the guy. His name is Merka. We can read that together. Merka. Okay. And here we see his title. Chereb Merut, and this means he is the head of a singer, so to say, the boss of a choir. We don't know, uh, we, uh, we do not have only singing, but we already had uh, already have um, choirs. And then, for several hundred years, nothing happens. And then, in the time of the pyramids, we have at once in the time of Chefren. Chefren is the one with the two, uh, with the second pyramid. The big one is Khufu, the second one is Chefren. And then we have harps for the very first time. You see here again a band from the time of the pyramids, harps, dancers, and see how ecstatic they dance here. So the very first harps, just to show you some originals. Another kind of harp. So we do not have a, a development a very primitive one and then a better one. No, at once, two different kinds and they are uh, on a very techni uh, high technical uh, level. And then we have drums again at the same time, 2600 BC. We see here a lady playing a drum on a boat. And we ha today we have the International Women's Day. I know you know that. and. Uh, I, I do not have this slide, slide with me because of that, but I love it. Because we have the possibility that the lady is giving the beat for the guys to row. I would love them, but uh, it's not written on it. <laughs> so, okay, we just have a guess. Good. As a list, rattles, 5th millennium BC. Clappers, 500 years later. Another, 200 years later. Our flute, at the same time, hand clapping. Another 100 years later, the first instruments as clappers, and our again 200 years later merka. So just to to uh, to give you an impression, once again back. In the first uh, 1,500 years, we have only idiophones. We have no melodies. So, is it true? Of course, we can only talk about what we have. So this is what we have. Maybe there were other flutes earlier, but they are not attested. They are gone, they are broken, they are not... Um, well, maybe you don't realize it during uh, excavation that this is a flute or whatever. Okay, and then we have a, a, again a gap and something happens now in Dynasty 4. We have the 
drum, uh, the harp and the drum. But much older is singing and hand clapping, but of course we have no archaeological evidence for this. So this, this is the, the very first thing how you do music. You sing and you do it with your own body. Yeah, but again, we cannot find it in the archaeological um, record. So we have to keep that in mind. If we um, look at Europe, what music do they had in Europe at that time? They had sound stones, musical bows, globular flutes, scrapers, clay drums, horns, overtone flutes, rattles and bone flutes. And you realize this is something absolutely completely different than we have in Egypt. So it's, a, it's an absolutely different culture. And then we have in the Paleolithic period so-called Balurora, 14,000 years BC. Have you ever seen it like this? Okay, I will try to show it to you. This is uh, nowadays even used for, uh, f uh, from the Aborigines in Australia. Okay, I hope I don't, yeah, I, don't know. I don't, hope I don't hurt anyone. <laughs> Okay, so this is a kind of wind instrument and here we have the discussion, is it already music? Is it a music instrument or is it just a sound instrument? Yeah, so we have to keep that uh, in mind that there are several levels of music. But nevertheless, now you learned European music is absolutely different from Egyptian music. So now we turn to ancient Egyptian music life before you fall asleep. <laughs> okay, we will talk about experimental archaeology. What is it at all? You build replicas of archaeological finds with the means of the time and you use them for what they were used in former times. As you see here, the X for a tree. Okay, and what am I doing? Experimental music archaeology. I invented this word, so to say, <laughs> because experimental archaeology, okay, this is a, a, an old bone, so to say, but this um, uh, experimental music archaeology, this is something new. And I am the only one, I suppose, in the world, <laughs> I don't know, who is um, connecting these ancient Egyptian uh, instruments together with text. If we play our uh, Neolithic flute, the internet is full with people who play the flute. But I have even more, I have the texts. Okay, and so this is what I try to combine. And uh, yeah, I hope I have, so, so to say, more of it than uh, if I would only play the instruments. So what can we uh, assume? We have no notation. This is very important. We have no notation, no notes. Okay, we can imagine they had slow music, they had up-tempo music, not formalized melodies for love songs, maybe more formalized for religious songs. If we have a text-heavy song, we can assume that there is less, less instrumentation, less complex melody and less tones instead of coloratura, so that the people can listen to the texts. What do we know about the performances? This is known from uh, depictions. They are in front of the, uh, also not behind, that would be another possibility, or to sit at the side. No, mostly it's in front. Uh, there are only a few listeners. And if you, real, uh, if you recognize the tiny lute, we know why. And uh, for the same reason, for acoustics reason, we have only a short distance. So probably I would sit directly in front of you to play. And there is no evidence for a musician holding a papyrus while playing. That means they all had it in mind. They had no notes, so they had to keep it in mind. Okay, so why? Are we working with that when we know so less? Why don't we say, okay, we know nothing, so keep it away? Um, so I'm, I would like to quote Professor Richard Parkinson from Oxford. He's working with ancient Egyptian poetry, what I would say is even more strange. <laughs> and he said, why is he doing that? Because Egyptians were human beings too. 
Poetry is a common humanity. Poetry is subjective and the commentator becomes the mediator and academics can learn a lot from it. So if we turn it now to music, music and emotions are inseparable and Egyptians were human beings too. Music is a human universal. You, you have no culture that has no music. And, of course, music is subjective and the artist becomes a mediator between the ancient art and the modern audience. So I am now your mediator. And again, academics can learn from me. <laughs> okay, so we have no notation, I told you. There are some things that might be a kind of uh, notation. For example, this one. We see a guy and he has a desk on his knees with some lines on it. You can see it. So some people say, hmm, this might be a kind of notation. It might be, but up to now it was not possible to decipher it. And then we have from the second century AD this papyrus. There are red dots and crosses on it. I'm quite sure you can see it. No, it was a joke. <laughs> of course you cannot, but you can see it here. Ah, okay, my transliteration is gone, nevertheless. Uh, this is the Egyptian writing, and you see we have dots, and at some uh, we have crosses. But they are not at the end of a line, so that we would say, okay, that makes sense for whatever, for breathing, or hmm, that, the, that the reader knows, okay, at this point, <gasps> I have to fetch my breath. No. Uh, so one researcher had the idea, maybe this is a beat, one point is a beat, and the cross is a double beat. I can read you the uh, translation. Spell for laying down cool things for your car. Gods and men, their arms are laden with nemzet jars for cleaning your car. Ha, sovereign, our Lord, we will not be far from you for eternity. Spell, words spoken by Isis, the goddess Isis. Ha, God, husband, come to me because I am lonely. Do not be far from me. Okay, so uh, you heard it when I read it, so let us now try it in music. Of course, in ancient Egyptians. Hmm? Hoi, E.T. Nep en, nen heri en, irek, jet ro, jet metwin o zet. Hoi, hoi, nefe mi, eni tui i waku nen heri ek eri. So you realize the difference. There's much more energy in it if you sing it, of course. So this was just one idea. Okay, and now we have the song of the Palakin carrier. We are in the tomb of E.P. We can read it here. You know already E.P. E. Okay, and E.P. has several carriers, 14. And between them there is a text. And some researchers uh, are of the opinion that this is a song. So that the first row sings it and the second and the third, yeah, so that they, uh, one after the other, and they sing it again and again and again until they reach their destination. So this is the theory. Okay, if it is a song, what I do not believe, because the word song does not appear. <laughs> Maybe it's just more or less a saying. But um, if we read the text, here. You realize that there is a kind of beat in it, yeah? And what do we know? These are hard workers. They will not sing coloratura. And probably they don't have a small, how do you call it, small scale, not so many tones. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we know the, t the tact because they are wearing a, a palanquin. Probably they don't 
wear it like this. Okay, you are of my opinion? Okay, good. Okay, so we will try it. I need your help now. Since we cannot all carry it together, we can sing it together. Okay, just to let you know what we are singing. Descend to the litter bearer who is strong. Descend to the palanquin bearer who is healthy. Soka on the sand. Soka is a god. Do not give a gift and keep the tomb owner Ippi from being given a gift. Make him a great one like one who is loved. I like the palanquin better full than when it's empty. Okay, so now we try to sing it. We start here and we have the beat. Mary, see me. Mary, see me. Er when and see sweet. Er when and see sweet. And then we would put down our pollen kin. Thank you. <laughs> and again, you realize the emotion. That comes from our singing together or just hand clapping together. And this is of course absolutely not academic. I have for you a love song, a love song from Papyrus Harris 500. And for that, I need the lute. At first I would sing it to you in English and then in ancient Egyptian. Please be tuned. Oh, okay. She's a, a diva, so to say. Okay, she knows she's the star. Better? Okay. So here we are, uh, it's about somebody who loves somebody and to make sure that things will really work out, she go he goes to Memphis to call the god Ptah, give me my beloved tonight. So this is a real uh, hieroglyphic text, it's not a fake. Hmm? I'm sailing downstream on the ferry, guided by the hand of the helmsman. With my bundle of reeds on my shoulder, I am bound for a Memphis. And I shall say to Ptah, the Lord of Maat, grant me my beloved tonight. The river is wine, Ptah its reeds, Zechmet its lotus leaf, Iadet its lotus bud, Nefatem its lotus flower, and the land lights up by her beauty. Memphis is a bowl of mandrakes set before the beautiful of face. Tah. Okay, and now the same in ancient Egyptian. Okay. So you realize there are a lot of gods in it. And some th things, not every, uh, sometimes we don't understand the meaning. We understand the words, but we understand, we do not understand the meaning. But this text is from 1300 BC. I sometimes do not understand German song texts, so. <laughs> Tu yem chet em tamechenet em zecha wen pazen pai imel he izi he remeni iu i er anshta ui iu i er jet em tach nep maat i imi eni senet em pager pai idrusum 
irf tapayev izi, ze chemet tayev zepet, iare tayev nehem, nefatem payev peresh, het taem neferu. Menefa gayen remet, watiem bach nefer Let us now turn to the next star, so to say, the Stele of the twins, Zuti and Hor. They are chief architects in the Temple of Amun at Thebes, Karnak 1375 BC. We have here a frame and these are invocations for offerings, Hetep Dini Zut and so on, and then you say what you would like to have in the afterlife. And then we have depictions of Zuti and his wife and of Hor and his wife in uh, front of Anubis, the god Anubis, and Osiris. And again, both are kneeling here, but these, they are erased. Yeah, so we, uh, you have to look very carefully. And there are 20 line, 21 lines. Um, here we have 14 lines in uh, adoration of Amun. And it's a, sun, a hymn to the sun god. And what is very interesting for the researchers is the fact that it anticipates the fam famous sun hymn of Akhenaten. Do you know Akhenaten, the husband of Nefertiti? And so this is interesting that we have it one uh, stage earlier already. And if you, uh, we will read it together, and then you will realize absolutely it looks, it, it sounds like the Aton hymnos. Okay, and then we have seven lines about their lives, the life of the um, two architects. Okay, so part one that I put music on is this one. Again, we can uh, read it together. Dua imen hefet uber den em herachti, in imira kat en imen zuti. This is our zuti. This is zu, uh, a small bird, a bread, and two, two uh, strokes, zuti. And then we have here imiri rakat en imen, the god imen, Hor. So this is our hor. This is, uh, these are the hieroglyphs. You cannot read it very, uh, very good because of the diorite stone. Yeah? And then you have the second stage, how you would translate it in the so-called transliteration. And the next, next step is that you really translate it. And then we would have adoration of Amun when he rises as Harachti by the overseer of the works of Amun, Zuti and the overseer of the works of Hor, they say. Okay, and I hope I have it here. Oh, I have it here, okay. Just to give you an impression what it's all about. Uh, Hail to you, Ra, beauty of every day, who rises in the morning without failing, Hebri, who tires himself with labor. Your rays are on the face, but it isn't known. Electrum doesn't match your splendor. Self-made, you created your body. Creator who wasn't created, the only one of his kind who passes eternity. Chief of the roads, with millions under his guidance. Your splendor is like the splendor of heaven. Your color is brighter than its hues. When you cross the sky, everyone sees you. When you set, you are hidden from their sight. Daily you present yourself in the morning. So, just to give you an impression. I know you can read it on your own, but... Okay, and then we have the second part. And this is, so to say, the, the interesting one, because it was said in the beginning, um, some researchers have the opinion that they are a same gender couple, but when we read the part, you will realize, no, they are simply twins. Okay, nevertheless, the overseer of works, Zuti and the overseer of works, Hor, say, I was administrator in your harem, overseer of works in your very shrine, made for you by your beloved son, the lord of the two lands. 
the Lord of the Two Lands is the Pharaoh, and here we have his name, Net Ma'adre, given life. And this is Amenhotep III. My Lord made me administrator of your monuments, knowing my vigilance. I was a dutiful administrator of your monuments, who acted justly as you wished. For I knew that you are content with justice. You advance one who does it on earth. So this is the uh, important thing. Pharaoh gave him a task and he made it in a way that Pharaoh was, uh, how do you call it, satisfied? Yeah, this is the next part. I did it and you advanced me, you rewarded me on earth in Karnak, the big Karnak temple in Thebes, while I was in your following when you appeared. I am a just person who shuns evil, dissatisfied with any words of saying falsehood. But my brother, my likeness, with his conduct, I'm satisfied. He came, this is the, uh, the part that is important, he came from the womb with me on the same day. So I understand it, they are twins. The overseer of the works of, of Amun in Luxor, Zuti and Hor, I was administrator of the west side and he of the east side. We administered great monuments in Karnak at the front of Thebes, city of Amun. May you grant me old age in your city, my eyes beholding your beauty, a burial at the west, a resting place while I join the praised ones who went in peace. May you give me a sweet breeze at landing, landing is the day when you die, and wearing of fillets on the day of the Wag feast. And the Wag feast is the festival of Osiris. Okay. So what did I do when I was asked, make music on it, okay. <laughs> at first I was very happy mm -hmm. and then I thought, okay, what can I do? Uh, I look at the text, I look at the content and I look for names of gods. And then as I told you in the first part, we have more a, a, a hymn, an adoration of the gods. So I sing it more formal, more like an invocation. And the next part, we learn some things about their lives. So I thought, okay, so maybe we can change the beat a little bit. Have some of you uh, listened to it already? No. Okay, wow. So this is an absolutely prem premiere. <laughs> so uh, what instruments did I use? Uh, I did not take my uh, Western guitar. But I uh, had a brainstorming, okay, which uh, instruments they use for uh, ritual music. And then I found this uh, relief from Luxor in Thebes. And this is the so-called Opet festival. This is one of the highest festivals you have in ancient Egypt. And then they use the lute. Yes, I have a lute. <laughs> and they use uh, our clapsticks, our clappers. Wonderful, no problem, we have it. Okay, and then uh, we, it's an invocation, so probably it's okay to use the sistrum. We learned that this is the instrument to call the gods. And uh, in the Yetfu temple, it's a little bit later, there we have something uh, on a festival for Osiris, and then there they use the round frame drum. So this is why in the recording I use the round frame drum. And at first we were discussing, okay, we put a beat on it and we could uh, put Mary, uh, very, uh, various instruments together. But when I started, I had the feeling, no, that's too much. It, no, uh, it's much better to have only one instrument and the singing, and then you can concentrate a little bit better on it. Okay, so I will try my very best. Of course, uh, Celine Dion would have 20 people around her, <laughs> helping her to fetch the stuff. But I'm quite sure we are entre nous. Nee, du bleibst hier. Yeah. Okay. Good. So let's try it. We start with the system. Tua imen, hefet ubenem en her achti, in rime katen imen zuti, imirakat en imen ho. 
Jet sen. Inek her egra, nefa en ranep. Uben, du er u, her nefer u. Kjeper i weret som kat, zut i em her en recht u es. Jam nen zu mi i mau ek, ptach tu ne bek hau ek. Mes es i uti mes tu ef, wa her hu ef, zebek nech ef, her i hau a hud, em her hu her zek ef. Amahu em herutek ten iu enes e imenes. So this was the first part. Now we try the second part. Uh, my husband heard it yesterday, the very first time, and he said, okay, this will not be a number one hit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm quite sure about that. <laughs> but of course, I did not um, compose it like that, because it's not something like that. And I had the feeling it would not be right to make a, so to say, a hit with a wonderful hook line out of it. Zuti ho, zuti ho, zuti ho. Imira kat zuti, imira kat ho. Jet f. Da draußen gepöbelt. Ine kjere bem i pet ek i mirat kamer meti iren sa ek mer i ek nep ta ui nep ma adra di ansh erdi en wi nep i her kjere bem u ek. Rechu resitep i, iri en i kjerep ken i, emmen u eg. Di egen i em i en u niet uk iri en nefer u eg, Shemata her i mentet, set het heb i. Iu i kjenem i em hez i u, shem em het heb. Di egen i tjeben e tjem, hefet men, tja i zeshe du, her u en neb u e. Just in case you have another five minutes, then I would sing an, another song with you together. Or do you have to go to bed? No. <laughs> You're not so early in London, isn't it? Okay, so we start with two um, names of gods. Isis and Osiris. You know the names, okay? Good, so you have to join me. Isis. 
O Syrien, and singing Isis. O Syrien, 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 Isis. Louder. O Syrien, Isis. O Syrien, Isis. O Syrien, Isis. O Syrien, Isis. Super. Isis. O Syrien, Isis. O Syrien, Isis. O Syrien, wonderful. Woo! You are amazing. Thank you very much. And it was a pleasure for me, just in case you have nothing better to do. Uh, if you have questions now, we can discuss them. If they come to you at night, tonight at 3, <laughs> please feel free to write me an email, uh, maybe calling not be at 3 o'clock. And uh, I wrote some articles about music. So if you're interested, write me an email and I sent you the things as a PDF so that you don't have to buy the books. And of course, as a musician, I have several CDs. Uh, just by chance, I had them with me. <laughs> just in case you have, I don't know, three, three pound or five pound, uh, the poor, poor musician would be very happy. He, there is no uh, ancient Egyptian music on it. It's only the cover. <laughs> but uh, rock songs from uh, rock songs beginning with the Phantom of the Opera. And uh, some Ita uh, Italian, uh, how do you, uh, ah, oh. yeah, thank you. <laughs> and love songs, just in case you want to learn German with ancient Egyptian love songs. I have one <laughs> CD. <laughs> it's the best way you can do it. <laughs> so uh, here you have love songs from the earliest Italian arias to modern songs like uh, Dream a Little Dream of Me or uh, some songs from me and recitations of the ancient Egyptian love songs. So if you uh, take some, I don't have to uh, take them back on the flight. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. I hope you did it as well. Thank you. Thank you. So do we have some questions? <laughs> Better not ask, then she starts talking and talking. <laughs> you know, what's this string, the um, bead necklace shaker? <laughs> the rattle is like made a necklace which is... Menid. Menid yeah. or menad? What would that, what kind of material would that um, Beads. Very different kind of beads. Uh, it can be one kind from faience, for example, or stones. Yeah, very different. Yeah. So how, how do you know that the shoulder blade, uh, you know, from the Neolithic? Yeah. Uh, um, how do you know that that was for used for percussion? There are uh, uh, beads on it. Yeah. Genau. Yeah. Hmm. And probably when the mammoth was dead already. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm just interested because obviously we've seen you do a solo presentation, but you mentioned that there were sort of groups, uh, ancient groups that played together. Is there any sort of scholarly work about the sort of interplay between instruments, and are there any groups that try and kind of recreate that as well? Uh, I did not understand it. So, so you, Can want, you want, Can yeah, sure. So you talked about sort of. Um, Bands? Portrayals of balance in it. Yeah. Are there kind of scholars working on kind of how the interplay of instruments? was and, and maybe trying to recreate that as well. Uh, well, um, this is very, very new, all this experimental music uh, archaeology. And so uh, I'm afraid if somebody, uh, somebody does it, then I, it will be me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so for the next show, I need somebody for the system and for the. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I made measurements with the instruments. And it's quite interesting. Um, the lute is very tiny. 
but for some instruments uh, they are getting louder the farer they are away. So this is quite interesting and obviously they knew it already. Hmm? Ask me, you will never find a music archaeologist alive. <laughs> Did yeah. you ever um, go and play the music in place, like try and find the places of making music? Uh, I'm just writing a book, a book about that. <laughs> okay, so the problem is um, sometimes you know it's open air yeah. and sometimes you see that they are sitting inside something. So it's a house or a tent. And the question is, uh, of course they make music in temples, so where? So this is my next problem, uh, my next problem, yeah, and my next uh, point of research uh, with a technical technician. I go to Egypt, yeah. and uh, we find out where the acoustics are the best. Yeah. Okay. Is there any indication in the Bible of the society where musicians might have been positioned? Yeah, this is not easy because we only know. Uh, a few people. These um, chantresses of God, they are very often from the elite. But uh, there are signs that are uh, people from the lower level as well. But nevertheless, in my opinion, everybody made music. It was like today, everybody was dancing and singing. But uh, the problem is what we have is very often from, uh, from the elite and not from the poor people who just had a small hole in the sand and maybe a cup for, uh, for drinking and maybe something for eating for the eternity and that's all. But that does not imply that, didn't, that they did not make music. Uh, yeah. Are all the songs um, like devotional or religious or do they cover a whole range of... You have so to say everything. We have a hymn to a chariot. But the text is so uh, fragmentary that I could not make a song out of it. So if you uh, have, to have to say every two tones, <laughs> it looks a little... So not just emotional, but and then the, um, the emotion, emotional content of the yeah. songs, how varied was it? Um, the love songs are very, very interesting and they have a, a great variety from really um, uh, just longing for you, and really deep love. Is it what you meant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have a, a, a wonderful range. Uh, of, uh, if you don't buy my uh, CD, you can look them up, the uh, Ancient Egyptian Love Song. You will find them in the internet. The texts are everywhere and they are so wonderful. They have so wonderful pictures. Yeah, when you uh, listen after that to a modern love song, you think, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> they should learn from the forerunners. <laughs> and you had a question? Yeah, yeah I was just wondering, um, obviously uh, you said there's no notation and there's no way of really knowing, but I just wondered, is there any kind of methodology in how you, uh, you know, when you're kind of imagining sort of uh, what scales are used or things like that, or even even like the way you use, you know, say the um, instrument, the piece of the metal, you know, whether you do something short, you do something long. What, what kind of, what do you base those sort of decisions on when you're, when you're um, imagining? The, from the lute, um, there are several instruments known. They were found and there were rests from these and from, um, from the length of the neck you can uh, calculate the tuning and this was done. So when I sing to the lute, I ask the lute, so to say, give me a melody. She gives me a melody and I sing it. So it's not something that I put out of the, of the air, so to say. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, uh, it's a fact-based imagination, <laughs> but uh, of course it's important to, to uh, still realize uh, we played smoke on the water. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we have a real big range, what could be and what, what could not be, who could have been, no, yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> and we have to keep that in mind. And of course from the flutes, well I'm not a um, specialist in flute playing, but from the flutes you know the tones as well. Hmm. But again, keep in mind, if somebody tries to sell you original Egyptian music... Hmm. Uh, I don't know, 30 years ago there was somebody who uh, went into the Great Pyramid 
and uh, made um, recordings with a, with, a, uh, with a flute or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and that was, so to say, a top seller. <laughs> yeah. Some of, yeah. How do you think the, so like the words spoken in these songs, how do you think they compare in like the rest of literature in Egyptian society? So is this like a main outlet of how they like express words? You mean, uh, you mean the, uh, how they, um, how you say, uh, pronounce it? No, no like, um, would you say like, how them singing words and poetry, is that the main oral outlet of literature? I have no idea, yeah. And again, um, we know so much about Egypt, but we know a lot of more we know not. Sorry, my spelling is not very good tonight, but I'm quite sure you understand me. And at least music is the only language that we are understanding all. <laughs> yeah. If you had a time machine and you could spend <laughs> an hour there, what, is there an event or a place that you would love to just be a fly on the wall and see what happens? Oh. This is a good question. I have never thought about that. But just when you say it now, I would like to know how Tutankhamen died. Because I do not believe in this chariot, <laughs> that he fall from the chariot. Because he had uh, very severe um, problems with his legs. So, and malaria, is it mal malaria? Mm. So it was a bad combination. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be music? No, uh, 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 in his, in his uh, tomb we had two trumpets. And we have clappers and a zistrum, a very strange zistrum. And I would ask him, why do you take this? <laughs> <laughs> well, take a lute. <laughs> so again, the interesting thing is this trumpet is military. And the other two are uh, some kind of religious. So don't you want to have a party yeah. in eternity? <laughs> yeah. I heard that recording of the trumpet. Ah, yeah. 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 But I hated it. Yeah, yeah. It just sounded like so, so militaristic. Yeah, yeah. It was a military tr a trumpeter. Is it? Is it, is it the yeah. right word? Trumpeter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so uh, he played it in really a way. Really hoped it wouldn't sound like that. So this is why I did not um, study modern lutes, but I asked my lute, "What do you tell me?" <laughs> so I had the feeling this is the better way. And it's a good point that you say it. We have to be, we have to be careful that we don't put our uh, meaning on the old music. No, it's not. So, and believe me, maybe it sounded horrible to our ears because we don't have this uh, tuning. But probably that was normal. Mm -hmm. Did they play that with a modern mouthpiece, though? It was played with a modern mouthpiece, yes, uh, because it was in the beginning of music archaeology. And now we know that the trumpet is not played with a mouthpiece mm -hmm. in ancient Egypt. It was not uh, necessary. Would it be played more like a conch shell or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. So feel free to have a look at all the instruments, play it, whatever, enjoy. <laughs> It was a pleasure for me. <laughs>